This sermon is titled Add to Your Faith. Be enriched as you listen. We've been learning about faith. And the reason we started you know, dwelling on faith and different aspects of faith is because uh, we believe that the word of the Lord for this, this year here for our church and the churches, uh, you know, uh, fellowship is that uh, the Lord has released this word, conquer through faith. And conquer through faith. Conquer what? Conquer what the Lord has already, you know, uh, promised to us uh, and whatever's coming in the way of that, right? Conquer our Jerichos and, and um, you know, walk in breakthrough and walk in um, overcoming the works of the enemy in our lives. And, and so uh, the emphasis is that, right? The Lord wants to do something in our lives. And so we've been learning about faith and uh, we said, you know, we need to take God at his word. We need to simply believe his word and speaking his word, you know, all that uh, we've, been, we've been learning. And even as we put that to practice, today's message is also something that is related to that. Okay? So today's message is titled, Add to Your Faith. Okay? Add to Your Faith. And it's interesting that Peter writes this. It's found in 2 Peter chapter 1, where he, where he says, add to your faith. So it's an epistle of Peter. This second epistle uh, is, is, was written during the, or, or through the, towards the end of his life. Right? It was the end of his life, maybe around AD 65 to 68. Towards the end of his life, Peter writes this epistle. And in writing this epistle, there's a reason why he's writing you know, um, so we find this in Second Peter chapter 1, verses 12 to 15, where he's saying, this is the reason I'm writing. This is the reason you need to do what, I, what you need to do. This is the reason you need to listen, right? And so he's saying this. Let's read Second Peter chapter 1, verses 12 to 15. It says, for this reason, I will not be negligent to remind you always of these things, though you know and are established in the present truth. Yes, I think it is right as long as I'm in this tent, to stir you up by reminding you, knowing that shortly I must put off my tent, just as our Lord Jesus Christ showed me. Moreover, I will be careful to ensure that you always have a reminder of these things after my decease. Okay, so this is Peter, and he's writing and he's saying, you know, I will not be negligent. I will not be careless. I will not be complacent to remind you of these things, to remind you always of these things, though you know it, right? So he says, you know, you know the truth and you are established in the present truth, meaning, you know, what the Lord is doing at present, so salvation and outpouring of the Holy Spirit and being led by the Spirit and all that, uh, gifts of the Spirit and so on. So you are established in the present truth. And, this, and, the, and Peter is saying, you know, um, though you are established, I want to remind you. As long as I'm alive, I'm going to remind you to stir you up in these, in, to the, with these things. I stir you up in these things, in these truths. And then he says, you know, the Lord has showed me that I'm going to move on. Right? I'm going to pass away from here. And he's saying, you know, I'm going to make sure that I leave a reminder so that even after I pass away, you are or you will be reminded. And this is a reminder for us. This epistle is a reminder for us. He has passed away. He has gone on to be with the Lord. But he has left that reminder for each one of us so that we will take note. So, that, so it's, a very, it's of utmost importance for every believer and for the church of God. Add to your faith. Okay, now uh, we're going to just read through this scripture portion, 2 Peter 1, verses 1 to 11. Okay, we're going to read through this scripture portion. If you have your Bibles, you can turn. Uh, 2 Peter 1, verse 1. Simon Peter, a born servant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who have obtained like precious faith with us by the righteousness of our God and Savior Jesus Christ, grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. As his divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us by, by glory and virtue, by which have been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises." that through these you may be partakers 
of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. But also, for this very reason, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue. To virtue, knowledge. To knowledge, self-control. To self-control, perseverance. To perseverance, godliness. To godliness, brotherly kindness. And to brotherly kindness, love. For if these things are yours and abound, you will be neither barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. For he who lacks these things is short-sighted, even to blindness, and has forgotten that he was cleansed from his old sins. Therefore, brethren, be even more diligent to make your call and election sure. For if you do these things, you will never stumble. For so an entrance will be supplied to you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Now this is Peter and he's saying, he's describing, he's listing down those things that we need to add to our faith. Now, if you look at Peter, Peter was a man of faith, right? He saw at close quarters what the Lord Jesus did. In fact, he, uh, when he was on the boat and when the Lord was walking on water, you know, he said, Lord, you command me to come to you. And uh, the Lord said, yes, come to me. And in great faith, he stepped out off the boat into the water. Fisherman, he knows what will happen when he steps out onto the water. But he did in faith and he walked to the Lord. Of course, he saw the wind and the waves and he started going down. But the Lord held him up, lifted him up. And I believe that he walked back along with the Lord back to the boat. Amen. So he's a man of faith. Right? And we also see that he, uh, this Peter, the same Peter, by faith, he, uh, he, he was going to the temple. He saw the man who was uh, sitting at the temple gates, at the entrance, and he could not walk. He, was, he, was, um, he could not walk from birth, the Bible says. And he lifted him up. By faith, he lifted him up and he said, what I have, I give you. And he saw the man being made whole and he walked. Supernatural was unfolding in his life. He goes to this place called Joppa. And he meets, uh, and he goes there and uh, they say that this person named Tabitha or Dorcas, you know, she is dead. And he goes there and he does the same thing which the Lord did, you know, at Jairus' house. He kneels, he kneels down, he prays and he lifts her by the hand and she raises up and raises her up to life. And so this is Peter who walked in faith. And this Peter is saying, add to your faith. Amen. We need faith to conquer. We need to walk in faith. The just shall live by faith. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. And this Peter is saying, add to your faith. So as we sit up and take notice, we see that, you know, when we add these things to our lives, he says, you will never be unfruitful, right? When we add these things to our lives, we will never stumble. He also says that we will not give up and turn back because an entrance will be provided to us, an abundant entrance into the everlasting kingdom. So we will walk, step into it, progress and not step back or burn out. Right? And he also says that in verse 9, he says, you know, if you do not add these things, that person who does not do that is short-sighted, is not able to see far ahead. And he also says that such a person will also, even to the point of blindness, meaning they're not able to see spiritual realities, not able to experience spiritual realities, he says, and such a person has forgotten what they have been saved from, that they've been washed from their sins. Right? They've been washed and been, their destiny has changed. And, uh, and so he says there's a danger of forgetting these wonderful things that has happened to us. And maybe just putting it aside and stepping back to our old way of living. So he's saying, you know, this is possible if you do not add to the faith. So he's talking about seven characteristics. So we realize that this is important. Coming from a man of faith who walked in faith. He's saying, add to your faith. So he lists down certain things, certain characteristics here. He talks about virtue, which is good character talks about knowledge, which is spiritual understanding and leading to a renewed mind. He talks about self-control or discipline. He talks about perseverance and endurance. He talks about godliness, kindness, 
and love. So we might have this question, you know, uh, should it be in order? You know, add to your faith, character, you know, uh, and after you're, you've added sufficiently, uh, then you move on to the things. No, we can't, you know, then when will we get to love, <laughs> right? So it is a list. It is a, it's, it's a list that he's giving us and he's saying you need to add to it. So it's not that we don't have to get stuck with one thing and wait for something to, to progress and, you know, and uh, graduate to the next one. So all these things he's given. So, um, you know, we, we, we did this as a study way back in 2010. How many of you were there? 2010, um, we did it as a study called The Seven Spices. Okay, so um, that was over a period of seven weeks. Okay. Now, this is the, this is the express, express version, right? So, uh, even as we go, move through, you listen fast, okay? Even as we move through this fast, you listen fast and hold on to it. Okay, the first thing is called character. Okay, just turn to your neighbor and say, character. You are a character, no. <laughs> you know, he's obviously talking about good character, right? Virtue. What is it? It is something that is good, something that is of good value, something that is excellent, Okay? And um, if, you, if you actually flip back to 1 Peter 2, he says in verse 9, you are a chosen generation. You are a royal priesthood, right? You are a special people, a holy nation. And he said, you are called to this, called to proclaim, right? Put on display with your words, with what you do in your lives. He says, you are called to put on display the virtues or the praises. You know, our translation says, the praises of God. Right? We are called to put on display the virtues of God or the characteristic of God. In other words, we are called to put on display Christ-likeness. Right? So we are called to this. We are appointed to this, to display good, godly character in and through our lives. So it's not an option, but we are called to this. You know, we, sometimes we, you know, we talk about our calling. You know, I'm called to this. I'm called to be a pastor. I'm called to be an evangelist. I'm called to be a, a prophet in the workplace. We take our calling seriously, right? So he's saying in the same vein, he's saying, you are called to this. This is your calling. Good character, right? And, um, and as, we, as we look at this, we see that uh, Christ-likeness or good character um, as we study this, we see that character is not what others think we are. We can put on a mask, right? We can say things, we can do things, we can, we can do our hallelujahs and praise the Lord. Character is not what others think we are. Because that, what others think we are is our reputation. And reputation can be managed, reputation can be, you know, adjusted and so on, carefully manipulated. Character is not also who we think we are. Sometimes you know, our estimation of ourselves can be higher or lower, we need not be always accurate. But character is who we really are, which means who we really are in private, in secret. When you get back home, who you really are, that's character, right? And our character is expressed in many ways. Though it is who we are in secret, is expressed in many ways. How? Firstly, you know, our private and secret choices. Our choices, not our public choices, our decisions, but our private choices. Our secret choices. These express our character. Secondly, companions influence our character. Our secret choices are influenced by our companions. And who we spend time with. And I just want to say that, you know, what we spend our time with, what takes up most of our time, influences our secret choices. It's interconnected, right? So uh, if you're talking about social media, or internet, and movies, and music, and books, and so on, you know, we, we spend, I think as a generation, it's, it's not going to end. We're going to spend a lot of time with our screens, yes? You know, we read our newspapers. Uh, through the phone, uh, my sermon notes <laughs> is in the phone, and uh, you know a lot of things. We are moving to digital things, and so it's here to stay. But we need to be discerning. We need to be discerning because on our friends group we get WhatsApp texts and WhatsApp videos and and all these things. We need to be discerning to what we spend our time in. 
where we spend our time, what we spend our time, because it's going to influence our choice. It is definitely going to influence our choice, our secret choices. And um, here's the thing, even as we go through adversities, even as we go through trials and challenges, character builds, character is built when we go through challenges, when we don't give up. So maybe if you're going through a challenge, maybe if you're going through an adversity right now today, don't be discouraged, right? Be strong in the Lord. And Romans chapter 5 and verse 3, this is what it says, verses 3 and 4. Not only that, but we also glory in tribulations, knowing that tribulation produces perseverance and perseverance character. So as we persevere through tough times and difficult times, character is being built. And Peter is saying that this strong character is needed. Add to your faith character. Amen. So turn to the person next to you, and if you, there's no one next to you, just turn behind and say, add to your faith character. Come on, let's add to your faith character. Amen. Amen. The second one that uh, Peter talks about is knowledge, right? He's talking about knowledge. And uh, so when we say knowledge, what exactly is he talking about? Is he talking about information? Is he talking about getting multiple degrees? Is he talk talking about all that, you know, experience and learning and so on? You know, all these are good things and essential, you know, for our career and, and uh, definitely we, we need this. But what is Peter referring to when he says knowledge? You know, earlier on in the epistle, you know, right, um, if you turn to... Chapter 1 and verse 2, it says, Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. Knowledge of God, knowledge of Jesus our Lord. Verse 3 says, As his divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us by glory and virtue. And the last verse in that epistle, it says, but grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So he's talking about knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus. He's talking about an intimate knowledge of knowing, of experiencing truth, knowing truth and experiencing the truth and growing, developing in the knowledge. You know, many times we think faith is simple. Yes, faith is. We need to have childlike faith in our Lord and Savior. We say, you know, I know about salvation. I know about uh, the anointing of the Holy Spirit. And I, I'm not going to go any further. I'm going to stop here. Right? I don't want to get all religious. And that's for the theologians. And that's for the pastors and so on. But we see here, Peter's writing to believers who share like precious faith, he says. And he says, add to your faith knowledge. So knowledge is spiritual knowledge and understanding. Amen? So why is this important? Why is adding to, your faith, faith, adding to our faith knowledge important? Because ignorance is not bliss. Ignorance is not bliss. You know, we know that knowledge is a burden. It's heavy. You know, you know something and now you can't, you know, you can't avoid it. You know it. You know some requirement. Uh, and we can't pretend it's, it's not there, right? But ignorance is not bliss. Hosea chapter 4 and verse 6, the Lord says, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. He's saying my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Why? Because the enemy takes advantage. The enemy takes advantage because, hey, he doesn't know or she doesn't know, doesn't have a knowledge of God. He's not growing in the knowledge of God. He's forgotten this. These are some things that God can do and these are some things that God will do. And this is who God is. This person has forgotten that God is good. This person has forgotten that God is with them. This person has forgotten. So spiritual knowledge and understanding is so important. So he says, my people are destroyed because the enemy has taken advantage and come and with this agenda of stealing and killing and destroying. My people are destroyed, he says. And he says here, because you have rejected knowledge, I also will reject you from being priest for me. You know, all of us, you know, this is our identity. The royal priesthood. We are royalty, sons and daughters of the Most High God. And we are called to be priests, people who represent God before people. People who represent people before God as intercessors, people who pray and so on. So, royal priesthood. And you're saying, you know, if, if you do not, because you have rejected this spiritual knowledge and understanding, 
you know, is, we disqualify ourselves from representing God before people. Right? Isaiah 5 verse 13 says, My people have gone into captivity because of their lack of knowledge. So, uh, ignorance is not bliss. Secondly, spiritual knowledge leads to our spiritual inheritance. Acts 20 and verse 32, Paul um, is, is addressing the Ephesians and he's saying, uh, the, the Ephesian leaders, he's saying, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and give you an inheritance among all who are sanctified. The word of God. The word of God is alive, powerful. right? And the word of God is not just information, but it's spiritual knowledge and understanding. He's saying, here, that I commend you to God, to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up, edify you, strengthen you, and give you an inheritance. You know, why is this a bridge to walking in the inheritance, spiritual inheritance that God has for us? Why is it? Because you know, we get the understanding of what has been freely given to us in Christ Jesus. And we need a reminder every now and then. Right? Our identity has changed. We have been clothed with the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus, even right now, because of the shed blood of Christ. Amen. The Bible says that we are more than conquerors in Him. The Bible says that we, are, we have been led, we will be led in a triumphant procession in Christ Jesus. And the Bible also talks about, Paul says, you know, brethren, I do not want you to be ignorant about spiritual gifts. Right? And it goes on to explain. So, we have so many things that are, that are available to us in Christ Jesus. You know, I'm sure that sometimes we, you know, maybe, uh, maybe it's a government scheme or some promotion or something, and then we realize, I, I, I didn't know this. I didn't know that if I could apply, that I could get a subsidy of this. I didn't know this. I didn't know that, uh, you know, there's so much here that, 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 that we can actually have access to. And we, 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 we come to such conclusion. We think, I didn't know that. So here he's saying, you know, spiritual knowledge, you know, it's not just accumulation of facts and information, but it gives us an inheritance, leads us to the inheritance that have been, that have been freely given to us by his grace. Spiritual knowledge also brings spiritual strength. You know, Daniel 11 and verse 32, but the, the people who know their God shall be strong. People who know their God shall be strong and carry out great exploits. Okay, So to grow in spiritual knowledge and understanding is not to just accumulate facts, but it is to receive this knowledge and to grow, it, grow in it, leading to the renewing of our minds. Right? Leading to the changing of our minds, changing of our old mindsets, changing of our perspectives about God, about His Word, about ourselves. Renewing of our minds, leading to transformed behavior, leading to Christ-likeness. Amen. So there's no, there's no shortcut to this. To grow in spiritual knowledge and understanding is to read and study and meditate the Word of God. To be intimate with the Word of God. To spend time with the Word of God. Uh, because the Holy Spirit is there to give us revelation about Himself. About the Word. Amen. Just look at it. You know, we have such a privilege that we have this God of heaven and earth... And we have the Holy Spirit indwelling us, the author of the scriptures, and he's saying, you know, I'm going to reveal these things to you. I'm going to highlight these truths to you. You know, I'm going to give you this wisdom. I'm going to, so you will have access to all this, that we may grow in it, right? Such an awesome privilege that we have. So even as we pray in the Holy Spirit, even as we pray in tongues, that's again an awesome gift in which we grow in revelation, grow in our understanding. That's why the Bible says, he who prays in a tongue edifies himself. Right? The gift of tongues, we don't have to be afraid of it. In fact, um, you know, after the service, like we announced, we're going to have this time. You know, what is this gift? What is this baptism? So please stay back. Okay, the third thing, we looked at character, we looked at knowledge. The third thing is this word called self-control or, you know, we can call it discipline. Okay, now, you might say, whoa, that's a bad word. Oh, you know, that's not there in my book, this word, discipline. I'm the person who goes with the flow, right? Who goes with the flow? 
I do things when I'm inspired. And when I'm not, I don't. Right? There's no intentional things happening, but it's only inspiring things, right? And we might, we might have all kinds of reasonings, but if you look at God, he's the most creative person. And he's a person, you know, and from him flows this gift of self-control, right? And the same word is used in Galatians 5, 22. It talks about this gift of the, or the fruit of the Spirit, the work of the Holy Spirit in our spirit to produce this wonderful quality called self-control or discipline. Just look back in our own lives. You know, I'm, I'm also doing this. By the way, I'm no expert. I'm just saying that I'm learning, growing, journeying along with us, and I'm preaching this hard to myself. Amen? Somebody saying amen to that? You can actually say, preach it. <laughs> right? I'm, I'm preaching it to myself. Right? Because, you know, we, we, if you look, into our, look back, there, there could be many projects that we've started, many courses that we've started, many resolutions that we made, and we're not continuing. Don't put your hands up. We're not continuing. Why? Because it's it's this, this ingredient which is missing, which is consistency, right? I was just reading the other day about James Clear. Uh, I, most of you I know would have read this book, uh, Power of Atomic Habits, I think. Uh, I, I forget the title, but James Clear, you know, not a believer, but, um, you know, um, so he writes this book and he talks about himself and he says, you know, how he started and, and how um, while in the play field, uh, a baseball bat was uh, slipped off from somebody's hand and then, you know, it hit him right there, right between his eyes. And for months he suffered. Now, he was actually planning to be a baseball uh, player and uh, get into a university with a baseball scholarship. But this happened and it took him many months to recover. But he says that he recovered because he just said to himself, I'm going to do those small things. I'm going to do those small things. And I'm going to be consistent with these small things. And he started, you know, this is what I did. He started a blog. He said, okay, this is what I did today. And he started actually a journal. Those small things that he did repeatedly, you know, no matter whether it's weather, no matter what weather, whether it's raining or shining, he did this over and over again. And he says that he came out of it and then uh, he started, you know, his, his blog became, um, you know, started going viral and a lot of subscribers and, and people started inviting him to, for keynote addresses and so on. And, and, and this all, he says, you know, I attribute these to these small things, right? For us to be consistent, to have this self-governing ability, you know, it's a fruit of the Spirit. The Holy Spirit is there to cheer us on. God is there to cheer us on and say, you know, I, I want to develop this. You know, would you say yes? I want to develop this in your life. Would you say yes? Right? And why is this important? Because it says in Proverbs 25 and verse 28, whoever has no rule over his spirit is like a city broken down without walls. Whoever has no rule. Just imagine your house without a door. Right? Without a gate. Without windows. Just imagine what would happen. Right? There's no protection, vulnerable to insects and infestations and whatnot, you name it. You know, this, we are making ourselves vulnerable. So that is what scripture says. Like, we might be the most gifted, most qualified, most talented person. But if we do not have self governing, governing ability uh, uh, to govern our desires, our inclinations, then we will be like that vulnerable uh, city without walls, right? So he's very clear, he's saying, you know, we need to discipline ourselves. So there are several areas, uh, at least three areas that we can discipline ourselves in because we are tripartite beings, you know, uh, three-part beings, uh, spirit, soul, and body. And what happens in our spirit is interconnected with what happens in our soul, our mind, our thinking, and, and imag imaginations, and, and emotions, and what happens with our body, right? This is interconnected. So uh, first thing we see is that we need to discipline our spirit. Ephesians 3.16 says, be strengthened with might through his spirit in the inner man. Through his spirit, through the Holy Spirit, be strengthened with might. And the word used there is dunamis, miracle working power of God, right? Be strengthened with might through his spirit in your spirit, in the inner man. So God's desire is really to strengthen us in the spirit, in the spirit man, right? We need to be strong in our spirit because that influences our thoughts, our emotions. That is interconnected. 
Second thing, we need to be disciplined in our minds, in our thoughts, and what we meditate on, our imaginations. Because it says, don't be conformed to the world. Romans 12, 2, we know the verse. It says, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. So what is renewing? In a nutshell, it's to take on and to discard. Right? To take on and to discard. To take on the thoughts of God. To take on the thoughts or the truth of God's word. Like to take on and, and meditate, think about it, and let it remain in our thinking. Let it change our choices. Let it change the way we decide. Oh, I thought like this about my enemy. I thought like this about my boss. But, uh, you know, I take on the thoughts of God. And now I pray. You know, that's the renewing of the mind. Right? And we also discard. We also give up. We, we make sure that we don't hold on to things that are of uh, thoughts that are fleshly in nature, uh, thoughts that are sinful in nature, and so on. Right? So a renewed mind is a disciplined mind. A renewed mind is a disciplined mind, and it, it gives birth to a strengthened will. It strengthens our will to say yes to the things of God. It strengthens our will to say no to the things that God is saying no to. So disciplining, being disciplined in our mind and being disciplined in our body, right? Being disciplined in our body. You know, this is sometimes this area we, we forget. Like recently we had a, bab, bab, I was about to say baptism, badminton tournament, you know, uh, office staff. And uh, I, I was the champion of champions, no. <laughs> You know, um, so I was playing badminton, of course, after a long, very long time. And, um, and then, uh, so my, my, you know, my mind is really, you know, going to the net and running back to the baseline and, and all these smashes and drop shots, and, which no one can take. No one can return, right? But my body is standing near the, <laughs> near the baseline and saying, you know, hang on, I'm coming. You know, my mind is running to the net and my body is saying, you know, hang on, hang on, wait, wait, we can't move that fast now. You know, take it easy. <laughs> you know, we need to discipline our bodies. We think that that is not spiritual. You know, but really if you see that we need to steward our health, we need to steward our health, you know, what diet, what we eat, what do we exercise and, um, you know, getting um, adequate rest and so on, so that... We can fulfill God's plan for our lives so that this shell, this outer body, this vessel is strong enough to go to places, to meet people, and we can do those things that God has called us to do. Amen. Amen. So being disciplined in our spirit and our soul and our body, and it is all interconnected. We know that when we are having a bad day, though we, are, you know, we, we don't have any illness, we don't feel like doing things. Right? We're having a bad day. Maybe we are, you know, emotionally we are down. We are discouraged. We don't feel like doing it. Why? Because our body is not moving fast enough. Our body is not moving in those directions because our mind is involved and is saying, relax, don't do it. Right? So it's all interconnected. So we looked at three things. Character, knowledge, and discipline. The fourth one is connected to discipline and it's called endurance. Amen. And it's, it's a word called endurance where we are the other words describing it of perseverance and patience. So to endure is to press through. It's the ability to press through no matter what. It's the ability to press, persevere with determination. To endure is to pursue with resolve that is undiminished. Okay? To endure is to be patient. It's also to be patient. Right? So sometimes we think, okay, I need to push through, I need to pursue, but... You know, this is a different picture, to be patient for the outcome, for the expected outcome. And to endure is to passionately hold on to what is right and um, true without weakening our grip on it. So endurance gives us durability, endurance gives us longevity, and therefore it can be developed, needs to be developed. And that's what Peter says, add to your faith endurance, perseverance, right? We need this. We need endurance when, when things that we do in life require effort, that requires time and preparation. Maybe you're preparing for, you know, for a medical college entrance or maybe you're preparing for a post-graduation course or maybe something to do in life, uh, I mean, in your office, some preparation, some proposal. We need endurance because sometimes halfway through or 25% into it, we feel like hey, it's too tough, it's too difficult, I think I just give up here. It's not God's will. You know, I'm facing too many obstacles, too many barriers. I don't think it's God's will. Right? 
But Peter says, you know, to have perseverance. You know, when things go wrong in life, maybe we have some life challenges, maybe some, some sicknesses and some things that went wrong, some, you know, uh, retrenchment in the office and, um, I'm sorry, uh, lay, uh, layoff. And, and um, you know, when things go wrong, we need to pursue. We need to hold on. We need to be patient. We need to push through. When there are delays to things, delays we don't understand why these delays are, we need to push through, right? And while we endure... While we do this work of enduring, now I just want to say that the Lord is with us. Amen. It's not a solo journey. The Lord is with us. And scripture says in Hebrews chapter 12, um, uh, it says that let us run with endurance, with perseverance. Let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. You know, many times we, uh, we need this endurance we need this endurance. We get up on Monday morning. You know, weekend we are fine. Friday nights we are fine. We get up on Monday morning and suddenly everything is weary. It seems like there are weights, you know, tied. We are walking around with a ball and chain. We are anchored to some, anchored to our bed. <laughs> Saying, oh man, there's a total shift from Sunday to Monday. Right? We need endurance. We need to press through. Right? So the, Paul, uh, uh, the writer of Hebrews is saying, let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Right? And he's saying, verse 2, looking unto Jesus. You know, something wonderful happens when we look into Jesus, when we focus on Jesus. Something wonderful happens because he is the source, the originator of our faith, the beginning of our faith, the author of our faith, and the finisher, meaning he brings to completion, he brings to maturity this thing. So I believe that even as we pursue, even as we endure, he's bringing to completion certain things in our lives that we thought will never complete. But we need to focus on Jesus. You know, yesterday morning, I was just going someplace and uh, I saw this auto rickshaw in front of me. You know, the Lord speaks through auto rickshaws, yes or no? Yeah, to me, a lot of messages come through, through the auto rickshaws. And it had just one word. It said, Jesus. And, you know, I was riveted. And I had to make sure that I didn't crash onto anything. And I was driving. I saw this auto rickshaw and it said, Jesus. I said, Lord, so beautiful. Just your name. It's so wonderful. Because it says, at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that he is Lord. And he said, he will never leave us. He said, he will never forsake us. We know what it means, what it means to be abandoned, to be rejected, to be forsaken. But he says, I will never do that. And further on, he says, you know, consider him who endured. So we are considering Jesus. We are focusing on Jesus who endured certain things. Secondly, to be anchored to his promises. His promises are yes and amen. His promises are yes and amen. And so we are anchored, you know, anchoring ourselves, tying ourselves uh, to his promises. And also to be inspired Inspired by the people of God. Inspired by the prophets. James chapter 5, it says, My brethren, 5 and verse 10, My brethren, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord as an example of suffering and patience. Indeed, we count them blessed who endure. So hey, look at those people. Look at Job who persevered. The, 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 you know, the, after that, verse 11 talks about that. He says, you heard of Job, perseverance of Job. So all these are for our learning. And all these are for us to be inspired, encouraged, so that we can walk in the way he did. Amen. And we hear in, you know, testimonies all around. And, and uh, that's good. It's happening to other people. Praise God. But we can be inspired, encouraged as we pursue as we walk. Okay, so we looked at four things. Three more to go. Is everyone here on board? Yes. Is, uh, did we leave anyone far behind? <laughs> no, please hold on. <laughs> right. Okay, the fifth one is godliness or piety or holiness or purity. Godliness. The scripture says, you know, 
Uh, those who are pure in heart, they shall see God. Blessed are the pure in heart. Godliness. Peter writes in several places. He says, you know, God who called us is holy, so be holy because he says, I am holy. He says, abstain from fleshly lusts which war against the soul. He also says, you know, uh, in verse 4, in, in chapter 1 and 2 Peter, he says, we are invited to share. We are partakers of the divine nature. Just think about that. We are partakers or partners, you know, just like Jesus said, you know, I'm the vine and you are the branches. Obviously, it's connected and what's flowing in the vine is flowing in the branches. We are partakers of divine nature. We are not divine, but we are partakers of the divine nature. Just think about that. Right? God has called us to be partakers of his divine nature, which is holiness and purity. And so we need to put on display, express this holiness and purity, which is nothing but godliness. Amen. So it's God, God's call for us, his invitation for us to live a holy life. So we might say, okay, I want to live a holy life, so I want to be alone. Right? Godliness is not isolation. It's not disconnection from everywhere. You know, I'm sure, you know, we've been tempted to say that, you know, I was, I was really strong in faith and I was, you know, following the Lord, but then I got married. And all these things happened. I got married and children and they're not allowing me to live a life. You know, all these in-laws and outlaws and, and whatnot. And, and I'm, I, I want to live a holy life, but all these things crowding and, you know, I'm not able to live, Right? So godliness is not isolation, is not disconnection and going off somewhere, but in the midst of where we are, you know, in the sphere of influence where he has placed us, Lord, with all the responsibilities that he has placed us, you know, to be in the world and not, not to be off the world, right? Godliness, to walk in purity, to walk in holiness. So it's not a holier-than-thou attitude also. You know, I've achieved so much spiritually. I've, got, I've been anointed and gifted and called, and therefore I put it on display in a boastful and arrogant manner. No, that's not godliness. Godliness is also not a set of do's and don'ts. So you spend time doing this. You know, you spend time doing that. You spend time, uh, yes, reading the word is good, but, you know, five hours of doing this, six hours of doing that, and yes, I'm godly. No, right? The Bible says, put on the new man, Ephesians 4 and verse 24, put on the new man which was created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. So godliness is daily, you know, everyone say daily, daily, it's not during the event, it's not during a conference, it's daily outworking of the inward change. You know, do you know that you are changed on the inside? Yes or no? Yeah, we are new creations on the inside because the blood of Jesus changed us, cleansed us. We are justified. We are made righteous. In fact, he has clothed us with his righteousness. You know, that's going to take an eternity to unpack. He has clothed us with his righteousness, the righteousness of God, right? So it is a daily outworking of that. Choices, thoughts, words, actions, a daily display of what we have already become on the inside. So I need to tell myself, hey, I'm the righteousness of God in Christ. That's why declaration is so important to remind ourselves and to tell ourselves, hey, this is who I am. Till it, you know, till my mind catches up with what I am already in my spirit man. Amen. So there could be challenges, temptations in the area of, you know, if you, if you say for men, area of sexuality, it could be ego, pride, fame, uh, power, influence, you know, the craving for that, giving into that. There could be some reasonings, some, you know, inducements to go off the path of godliness. Self-sufficiency, money, intelligence. And for women, well, not only exclusively for women, it could be about, you know, a craving for being loved and accepted, self-identity, self-esteem and affirmation and so on. Some responses to temptation. Guard against temptation. We are called to guard against temptation. Raise up that shield of faith and say, if this is temptation, and, you know, when we discern that it is temptation, we know that it's not for our good. It is to take us off the path of godliness. So guard against temptation. Secondly, resist temptation. Resist temptation, which means, you know, don't be passive. Be active, be strong. Resist temptation. The third one is to flee from temptation. 
You know, there are times when we need to flee. The Bible says, flee youthful lusts. It says flee, you know, do not be in that place. Remove yourself from that place. Flee temptation. Amen. So there's no point in negotiating. There's no point in having a dialogue. No point in reasoning in that place. We just quit, exit, leave. The sixth one, we looked at five. The sixth one is kindness. Wow. You know, when we look at these you know, all these attributes, we see that these are simple things. You know, these are things that I sang about in children's church. These are things which was there in the coloring sheet that they gave me. You know, all these things, I colored these things. You know, if you grew up in church and saying, hey, I've heard these things. I've sung about these things. And that's why Peter says, hey, I want to remind you. This is a reminder. But we see that these simple things have so much of depth in them. But these simple things are you know, we really work against our flesh and we need to mortify our flesh in walking in these. And so he's saying, add to your faith, kindness. Kindness is not a sign of weakness, right? Because we see in Galatians 5, 22, 23, that is the fruit of the Spirit, kindness. Saying Holy Spirit is working in us to bring forth kindness, that we may display kindness. So kindness is not weakness. Kindness is what we have called to. Kindness is what the Holy Spirit is working to produce in us. 1 Peter 3 talks about all kindness. He says, you know, be compassionate, be tender-hearted, courteous, and so on. And he says, you were called to this, knowing that you were called to be compassionate you know, uh, or kind. So Kindness is expressed in very simple ways when we show mercy, when we don't retaliate, when we forgive, when we speak with kindness, our words, right? Many times our words are harsh, right? Our words are harsh. We live in a world that is harsh. You know, let's face it, it's, you know, it's, it's hostile and some of it rubs off and we respond with harshness. In the home, with those who are most, you know, who are closer to us, closest to us, out of familiarity, we say, okay, familiarity breeds contempt, so harsh words. You know, uh, if you're a married person, you'll understand this, I think. You know, you're married for, let's say, five years, six years, uh, down the line, and then you're, you learn a new language, right? Yes or no? It's a simple language, uh, and I want to teach you that, but don't follow that, right? It's a language called, it's got only one syllable, but you use it differently. It's called, mm. <laughs> You don't hear that with newlyweds. I don't think so. But it's, uh, it's called, mm. And it's like this. Have you had coffee? Mm. You know, did you get this from the market? Mm-hmm. <laughs> and that's it. The vocabulary. Sometimes in our homes, with people who are closest to us. The mm language. Right. So the Bible talks about kindness in our words, in our communication with gentleness and honor. And uh, just want to remind you, I'm speaking this to myself, right? Uh, in giving, in showing hospitality, in serving sacrificially. So, so we might say, you know, I don't have the time, I don't have the schedule. You know, I, I have a busy schedule. Uh, I'm doing this. So that comes as a challenge for us. So we need to understand that, hey, it's never going to be convenient to be kind. If we would reconcile, it's always going to be inconvenient. Hospitality, you buy pizza, you buy some stuff, and then somebody shows up. This is India. We don't fix an appointment. Ting tong. Hi, we just thought we'll drop by. Oh my God. We need to split that pizza now. You know, as kids, we thought like that. You know, oh no, why did that uncle come now? Right? So we, if, we, if we reconcile to the fact that, hey, it's never going to be convenient. And I'm going to be kind anyway. Some other challenge could be abuse of kindness. Abuse of hospitality. It's not a new problem. It's an old problem. Right? We did our best. We gave. We served. We were hospitable. Somebody abu abused that. Right? They didn't even acknowledge it. Or they abused it. Second in 2 Thessalonians, we see this. Um, you know, maybe we just read those verses. Um, in verse 11, he says, For we hear that there are some among you, 2 Thessalonians 3, verse 11, We hear that there are some among you, uh, some who walk among you in a disorderly manner, not working at all, but are busy bodies. 
Now those who are such, we command and exhort through our Lord, Jesus Christ, that they work in quietness and eat their own bread. But as for you, brethren, do not grow weary in doing good. So he's saying, you know, this is the problem. There are those who are disorderly, they're not working. It's not a question of capability, but inclination, attitude. Right? It's not they're not able to, but they're not willing. So they're not working. They're working dis, you know, disorderly, busy bodies, trying to get something here, something there. And he's saying, you know, for those we have commanded, we have corrected, saying you cannot be like that. But as for you, brethren, he's saying, don't grow weary. Don't be discouraged. Don't grow weary in doing good. Amen? So let us not grow weary. Maybe we're at that place, some of us saying, you know, I've helped this person too, so much. Never again. Never again. Never again will I give. Never again will I, you know, do this. Never again will I show hospitality. Because it has backfired on me, so never again. But keep our hearts tender towards God. Right? Okay, the last thing that we're going to look at, I just want to call the worship team up. The last thing um, is... Something again, very simple. This conversation that the Lord Jesus had with the lawyer when he came and said, what is the great commandment? And the Lord Jesus turned to the lawyer and said, you shall love. This is the great commandment. You will you shall love. And he said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. And he said, you love your neighbor as yourself. And I'm sure Peter was there. When this was happening, Peter was there. He, heard the over, he overheard the conversation. The Lord saying, what is the great commandment? You shall love the Lord your God. And you shall love your neighbor as yourself. So loving God with all our heart. And so the Holy Spirit is quickening Peter to put this down. And he writes down and he's saying, add to your faith, love. Add to your faith, love. Now this word also has been much aligned in today's culture, right? Much aligned. We think of love, we think of violins and roses and, uh, you know, candlelights and, uh, and all that. And, and all that is good, right? But love is also a choice. It's a tough decision. It is when your spouse says at 3 a.m., you know, can you go get me a glass of water? And you're all lying cozy and nice. And, and uh, that's tough love. To so say, okay, I'll go. That's tough love. Love is tough. Right. Just want to read for us um, what we uh, see in 1 Corinthians 13, and it's a very familiar, you know, piece of scripture, uh, verses 4 to 7. And I just want to read from the Passion Translation. It's taken some liberties, um, and uh, but it's it's so beautiful, right? This is how it goes: Love is large and incredibly patient. Love is gentle and consistently kind to all. It refuses to be jealous when blessing comes to someone else. Love does not brag about one's achievements nor inflate its own importance. Love does not traffic in shame and disrespect nor selfishly seek its own honor. Love is not easily irritated or quick to take offense. Love joyfully celebrates honesty and finds no delight in what is wrong. Love is a safe place of shelter for it never stops believing the best for others. Love never takes failure as defeat, for it never gives up. Amen. And guess what? Our Lord and Savior, He has this love for us. This very same love. This is the kind of love that He has for us. Never giving up. Agape, unconditional. No matter how far we have run away from Him, no matter how much distance we put between ourselves and God and, and the things of God, you know, He's pursuing. He's the one who's able to save to the uttermost. This is the kind of love that He's given us. Romans 5.5 5 says, the love of God has been poured out into our hearts. And if you're thinking it's so tough to love people, well, the Holy Spirit has given us this love to love others. The problem is that it needs to find an expression. It is already inside of us. This love is already inside of us. It has been poured out into our hearts, but it needs to come out. It needs to find expression. Amen. 
which is going to talk to the lord and in worship and he's going to tell him lord lord let your fire change me let your fire refine me god i want to add to my faith i want to add to my faith these things i don't want to stumble i don't want to be unfruitful i want to step in i don't want to burn out in life god i want to add to my faith come holy spirit enable me empower me amen cabbage is raised to our feet for you god we want to live for you god yes lord we want to live for you father god and stake our lives even as we give ourselves oh god to you as a as a living and willing sacrifice lord change us from the inside out master change us from the inside out and lord you add to us lord even as we, as we lord say okay say a big yes to the work of your spirit lord let there be a cleansing let there be a refining let there be a strengthening within us lord let there be a reviving god to pursue these things father god to lord to follow you to pursue you jesus in a renewed way god because you are all we want you are all we need and i believe the lord is giving us a you know a second chance at life itself you know a second chance you know saying that maybe we were saying that oh god i had all these things burning in me but lord things have become jaded with life things have become jaded oh god with what have i gone through and and um, the lord is saying you know i'll take off the peel i'll peel off those layers i'll take off those layers so that our hearts are tender towards him our hearts are tender towards his people He does not want us to stumble and fall and he wants us to finish the race with endurance. Amen. Amen. And if there's anyone here and you've been seeking Jesus, thinking about Jesus, you've come to the right place, you've come to the right person. Jesus, Lord Jesus. So beautiful, he's so loving. And he's just inviting you to be part of his life. if you will invite him to be part of your life and if you're here and if you've never ever invited jesus into your heart you can do that and say lord jesus come into my life i don't understand all these things god but 
I know one thing that you died for me on the cross. You took my sin on the cross. I invite you, come into my heart, come into my life. You can pray that prayer in the quietness of your heart. You can say, Lord, I believe you died for me. Lord, I believe that you rose again on the third day and I believe God that you removed everything that was separating me from you. And so today there's nothing separating me from you. And so I invite you into my heart. You can go ahead and pray that prayer. Jesus, you hear our prayers, God. You hear our cries. Now, if there's anyone and you prayed that prayer, you prayed that prayer, you invited Jesus. Can, you just, can I see your hands, please? You can just put it up. You pray that prayer for the very first time, right? It's the first time that you're praying. Anyone? Anyone? You prayed that prayer. Okay, we just want to give you um, a packet and you just receive that. It's called a New Believers Pack. And you can write your name in that card. Anyone else, you know, those of you who are walking, I mean, who are watching online, uh, if you pray that prayer and uh, you can put it in the chat, I pray that prayer. And you can write, send an email to, um, to contact at apcw.org or any other emails that, you know, somebody who's moderating the chat is putting on and you can write and say, I pray that prayer. Right? Amen. Amen. And for those of us who are here, you know, it's another opportunity to walk with the Lord, to walk in victory. The Lord is with us. He is for us. He is not against us. To so be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make His face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up His countenance upon you and give you and give us his shalom. Amen. Amen.